I must thank the organizers for inviting me to make a speech, a, a topic which has been selected by the uh, program. And I have been asked to speak on rise of a monastery, origin to spread. So I was thinking whether uh, should we call this a monastery? I think yes. A human race, surviving human race now has never seen a monastery uh, like this one. Which, is, which has caused a havoc, a disaster of very long duration, and has produced many consequences, like health in terms of morbidity, mortality, physical health. It has affected the psychological health and causing a large number of psychological morbidity. It affected the non-COVID conditions. As well as it has affected the economy, it has affected the society, it has affected uh, in various other forms. It has changed the world. In one way. And after this epidemic, we are going to face a new world. Everything of the old world is not going to persist. Maybe we will be taking, adopting some new culture. So it, it is a really true, serious monster and human race of my generation could see a, a airborne infection, viral infection, uh, has the potential to cause such a havoc globally, pandemic, and uh, that, and it's not that uh, we are going to be finished with the pandemic. Even after the pandemic is over, uh, the population of the earth is going to see a pandemic of psychiatric morbidities and mortality. is going to see an epidemic of potential diabetes mellitus, an epidemic of deconditioning syndrome, uh, in addition to its uh, uh, persistent uh, medical care, requiring persistent medical care. So all these problems are going to be out of this, and undoubtedly this is a monastery. So the uh, the, if we, if I look into events, this is 30th December 2019. That a test report addressed in Wuhan, uh, uh, there was an erroneous positive result for SARS, causing a group of doctors to alert their colleagues and relevant hospital authorities about the result. And eight of these doctors were later jailed, punished for. Uh, spreading false humors. Later on, on the day they were punished, the same evening, Wuhan Municipal Health issued notice to various medical institutions about the treatment of pneumonia. So the 31st December, first time China informed WHO that there was a cases of pneumonia of unknown cause in Wuhan. An investigation was launched at the start of January. On 11 January, the WHO received 2020 further information from the Chinese National Health Commission that the outbreak is associated with exposures in one seafood market in Wuhan, and that the Chinese authorities has identified a new type of coronavirus, which was isolated on 7 January. Thereafter, it sets on. The first confirmed death in Wuhan was on 9 January. The first death outside China was in Philippines on 1st February. And, and first death outside Asia was in the United States on 6 February. So based on retrospective analysis and uh, molecular clock analysis suggests that the index case is likely to have been infected with the virus between mid-October and uh, mid-November. The first, uh, 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 most important publication we can say came out on 24th January in Lancet, indicated that human transmission, strongly recommended personal protective equipment for health workers, and say testing for the virus was essential due to its pandemic potential. Within a week on 31st January, Lancet published first modeling study, explicitly warning the inevitable independent self-sustaining outbreaks in major cities 
globally, calling for large scale public health intervention. So on 11 February, WHO named the disease as COVID-19. Uh, and uh, in March, the, the, within by the March 2021, uh, about 1 billion, 1.7 billion people worldwide were under lockdown, some form of lockdown, which increased to 3.9 billion by the first week of April more than half of the world's population. So regarding the origin of the virus on 11 February WHO, okay, the current scientific consensus is that the virus is most likely of genotic in origin from bats or another closely related mammal. Despite this, the subject has generated a significant amount of speculation and conspiracy theories, which were amplified by rapidly growing online eco chambers Global geopolitical divisions, notably between the United States and China, and have been heightened because of this. So in March 2021, WHO again published a report that the potential do not show the virus. In, in October 2020, WHO started a special meeting of WHO leaders that one in 10 people around the world have, may have been infected with COVID-19 already. At that time, that translated to 780 million people being infected, but while only 35 million infections have been confirmed. Then came some good news. On 9 November 2020, Pfizer released their trial results for a candidate vaccine, showing that it is 90% effective against the virus. Later that day, Novavax entered an FDA fast track application for their vaccine. By 9 November 2020, USA has already exceeded 10 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. So the last quarter of COVID-19, uh, 2020, uh, was another uh, bad information with the detection of variants, which are later named as variants of concern, has started to modify the pandemic epidemic. The virus showed changes to the spike protein, which could make the virus more infectious. Then there is arrival of the vaccine, and all these issues have been uh, discussed here. So the, during the whole course of the epidemic, in the initial part, the whole of the world people became panicked. And panic reaction spread all over. Uh, causing limitation of supplies, causing limitation of uh, availability of supplies, including medications. And many of these informations were inappropriate. That means there were misinformation and disinformation, which affected the epidemic. And it has been named infodemic. So the, the whole world has seen has experienced that there is requirement of a timely action in responding to the epidemic. We have seen a coordinated action essential to combat such an epidemic. And uh, a variety of information sources have started generating opinion and science solution and solidarity have became the focus for addressing the biggest health threat of the past century. This is the story of the response we built with the COVID-19. COVID-19 infects people when they come together, but coming together is also how we will beat COVID-19. So 2020 saw the world unite against the virus, from a small personal gestures to protect others, to international collaboration on research and innovation, the year ends with COVID-19 vaccines rolling out and an extraordinary fitness of the science, of the application of science. So ensuring equitable access to safe and effective vaccines among the lower income countries and vulnerable populations has become the core mission now since the onset of the pandemic. Travel restriction and reduced flight 
put immense pressure on global supply chain. Increased outreach was especially vital given the infodemic. The flood of information on the COVID-19 pandemic, not all was reliable with harmful rumors and misinformation about the virus. But health workers remain the backbone of the COVID-19 response around the world. In some places, they had to temporarily shift their focus from responding to other diseases. And other diseases also suffer. So in the most challenging settings, the global community is working hard to keep essential health services running, but there is much more to do in 2021. The pandemic still raises in large part of the world, including in Bangladesh now, and there are massive funding gaps and massive uh, uh, inequity of distribution of the vaccine. So the, we are facing a real risk of vaccine nationalism and the best tools against COVID-19 not being shared fairly among countries. Many health systems are struggling to roll out COVID-19 vaccines, tests and treatments while managing all other areas of health. So what we can conclude that it gave us a big learning from the human race to learn their health system, to learn their ability to respond to epidemics in future and to develop established a, a, a surveillance system which can easily detect those conditions. So overcoming these challenges to ensure COVID-19 releases its grip on our life in 2021 will require us to come together with humility, humanity, and generosity such that the cloud is still not over, but we are optimistic that the world will come out sometime from this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, uh, Professor Idin Rahmat, sir, for your valuable and informative speech. Our next speaker, Dr. Shejuti Shaha. Dr. Shejuti Shaha completed her Bachelor of Science with Biochemistry major at the University of Toronto. She also received her PhD from the same institute. Currently, she is working as a scientist at the Child Health Research Foundation. In the year 2020, Shejuti and her team decoded the genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2 virus in Bangladesh. Shajuti Shah, over to you. Please share your skin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it is such an honor to be part of this conference and to be also a part today of um, IPDI. So thank you for the invite. I am going to share a little bit of knowledge that we have about the circulating variants. Uh, in Bangladesh and what does that really mean for us? I'm gonna share my screen. And I hope you can see me all right on my screen. Okay. So um, uh, I work at this institute called the Child Health Research Foundation. It's a, it's a not-for-profit and there are several things that we focus on. But as our name suggests, we are a children-focused organization. Uh, for about 30 years, we have been conducting um, several different surveillance programs to understand, for example, what causes fever uh, or the organisms that cause fever, like uh, Salmonella typhi, Salmonella paratyphi, and their antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we also do uh, outbreak investigation, dengue, chikungunya, and of course, now we are um, tightly involved in SARS-CoV-2 uh, investigation and surveillance. In addition, uh, we focus on uh, meningitis in children or respiratory or pneumonia-like uh, illnesses in children caused by either bacteria or viruses or uh, causes that we don't really understand. What we try to do is use all the data that is generated in the community by our community team, team of doctors, or in the lab. We try to use that data and translate the data such that they can be useful for the policymakers of our country. Uh, it was data from our organization that actually helped uh, or facilitated introduction of the Hib vaccine in 2009 and then the pneumococcal vaccine in 2015. But for the purposes of today's talk, we will focus solely on SARS-CoV-2. So just to give you a recap of what the virus looks like, because that's what we will be talking about for the next 14 minutes. So um, this is 
kind of what the virus looks like. The outer shell is made of different proteins and lipids. And the structure of these proteins, which are extremely important for the function, is determined by RNA here. Uh, but before I go to the RNA, one of the most important proteins that we constantly discuss is the spike protein over here. Spike protein that we will come to in a bit is the protein that uh, makes the virus or helps the virus attach to human cell and cause infection. Now, what this protein or anything else on the outside will look like or will function is dependent on the genomic material of this virus. Uh, specifically, SARS-CoV-2 is genomic material is called RNA, ribonucleic acid, and it is made up of about 30,000 nucleotides of these pairs. Now, RNA is made up of AGCU. Whenever there's a change in one of the nucleotides or one of the letters, we call that a mutation. You know, it could be a deletion of a letter, the abyss, an insertion, or it could be a simple change where B and A becomes a G, and that is what we call mutation. Now, we hear about mutations all the time. Why do mutations occur? And how uh, do mutations occur? Um, it's Mutation is actually quite common in some biotech a lot more than others. Specifically for SARS-CoV-2, what happens is one virus using that protein called the spike protein binds to a cell receptor. Uh, it goes inside, injects its kind of, uh, puts its uh, RNA inside the cell and then inside the human cell and very quickly hijacks the entire machinery of the human cell such that the human cell does work for uh, anymore, the cell starts working for the virus, and in that process, of the virus starts replicating. One virus goes in, hundreds and thousands start coming out. In this process of making many, many copies, of are called mutations that I already described in the previous slide. Now, these mutations or this mistakes are very common, and most of the mutations do not mean anything. Actually, there are some mutations that make the virus weaker, such that it either dies out or cannot infect anymore. Only in a very few cases can these mutations become concerning. So we talked about mutation. We are worried about the mutations, uh, specifically those mutations that change uh, the structure of the spike protein, because remember, that's the one that binds to human cells. What happens is if a set of mutations start appearing in one virus and that virus starts spreading with the same set of mutations again and again, we call that a variant. So far, we have seen many, many variants. We are not concerned about them, but there are four variants that are concerning, that we're concerned about because the mutations they carry um, can cause harm. Uh, those four uh, variants are called alpha, that was detected first in the UK, beta, first detected in South Africa, gamma, first detected in Brazil, and finally delta was first detected in India. Why are they concerning? This is concerning because there is very good evidence that says that either um, they are more transmissible or uh, they can cause more severe disease or they can escape previous infection or vaccines. Whenever one of these criteria is fulfilled, it calls them a variant of concern. In addition to this variant of concern, there are many, many variants of interest. Uh, we hear no, uh, we hear names of we hear names of different variants. Uh, we don't know whether they're dangerous or not, but we try to keep an eye on them. They're called variants of interest. Okay, so now we know what are mutations, what are variants, but how do we track these mutations? How do we track these variants? How do we know what's in Bangladesh or what's in India? We know that by next generation sequencing. We've been hearing about sequencing quite a bit these days. So how does sequencing work? Sequencing is actually quite a simple process, which begins with just collecting a sample from a patient uh, with a suspected infection. Right. And then what we do is uh, through a simple PCR test, if that uh, sample is positive for SARS-CoV-2, what we do is extract all of the RNA from the sample. Remember, I told you, right, SARS-CoV-2 is made up of RNA. Then we convert all of the RNA into DNA because 
DNA is more stable, can be changed, manipulated, and it can also be sequenced. After uh, making it into DNA, we specifically amplify. We again use very simple methods like PCR. We selectively amplify the DNA that came from SARS-CoV-2. We make sequencing libra libraries. Again, very simple procedures can be done in any lab. Uh, and then we sequence. All the sequencing happens uh, inside a machine. And now the systems are quite automated. It takes about you know, um, a day, about 24 hours to sequence. And then when we get our sequencing um, data, we try to assemble that entire RNA, entire genome of the virus. So the 30,000 base pairs. As soon as we are done uh, assembling that genome, we assess their quality. Uh, we ensure everything is fine, and then we make the genomes publicly available. So we upload them into different databases like GISAID. Why? So that, you know, in Bangladesh, all the scientists can compare, can share data and understand what are the viruses that are circulating in Bangladesh. At the same time, GISAID is the place, is the place where the entire world is depositing their data so we can compare each other's data. We can see what variants we have here. What variant does Italy have, for example? Using sequencing, it can answer many questions. For example, when did the virus enter the country? Uh, was it travel related? Is it spreading in the community? If it's spreading in the community, how fast? What are the mutations we should be concerned about, etc.? So the sequencing effort that this world is seeing is absolutely incredible, fantastic. We have never seen any sequencing effort like this before. Of course, in our lifetime, we haven't seen a pandemic like this either. So, so far, more than 1.8 million SARS-CoV-2 genomes have already been sequenced in different countries. And all of these sequences have been made publicly available on GISAID. So this is actually just a screenshot from GISAID. This was last updated on the 22nd of June. Uh, and then once these uh, genomes are uploaded to GISAID database, uh, what we can basically do is use different softwares to look at the relationship between each of genomes. This is uh, what I'm showing you over here is called the phylogenetic tree. Uh, this phylogenetic tree uh, is available in this website called Nextrain, and every dot over here is a genome. The closer the dots together, uh, the close, more closely related the genomes are. Specifically in this phylogenetic tree, what we are seeing on the x-axis is time, right? Right at the beginning of the pandemic, 2019 December, and gradually we're moving forward in time. We're in June 2021. What we are seeing is uh, the, the dots are increasing and we are seeing some colors. Colored dots represent variants of concern or variants of interest. So previously, all the variants that we were seeing, we were not concerned about them because they were all similar to the original SARS-CoV-2 virus that was first detected in Wuhan. But as time went on, we are seeing that they are gathering some concerning mutations and we are calling them variant of concern or interest. And that is what we're tracking with time. Over here, we can see is that the proportion of variant of concern is increasing with time. For example, in blue over here is the alpha variant, which was first detected in the UK and is now the predominant variant that is uh, found all over the world. And gradually, we were also seeing uh, an increase in the delta variant all over the world. Something to keep in mind always is although uh, initially, some of these variants were given names of countries because they emerged in certain countries, but as had, it has become really clear, infectious diseases, viruses don't know boundaries, right? A variant might emerge anywhere, uh, but it can spread very, very quickly throughout the world. So when we're talking about controlling COVID, we always have to think globally, just controlling it in one country is not going to help. You know, if US says we are going to keep all the vaccines and we're going to just protect our country, it's just not going to help. Because as speakers have said before me, we are all in this together. So whenever there's a variant anywhere else, it is bound to spread globally. And that is really what we are seeing over here. So again, these are pie charts of different variants and in color are the variants of concern or interest. And we see all over the world, these variants of concerns are spreading. And not only in South Asia, but in other countries, we're also beginning to see surges this summer again. 
So this is pretty much a view of what's happening in the world, but what's happening in Bangladesh, right? So let me go back to May 2000, uh, 2020 for a little bit. Um, so the first sequence from Bangladesh of sars cov was made available on May 11, 2020. And uh, this was done at our organization, uh, CHRF. And this, our uh, organization started working as a testing laboratory on the 29th of March 2020. And as I have said, we have been working on, you know, pathogen genomics and surveillance for a long time. So we had practice of sequencing. We had done a lot of sequencing before. So the moment we became a, a diagnostic lab, we started thinking about how do we sequence? How do we sequence? Because other countries had already started sequencing and vaccines were being made. When you're trying to develop or design a vaccine, it's really important to know what are the different variants circulating all over the world. So we didn't want our Bangladesh data to be lacking from the global database. So we started focusing on sequencing, and then on May 11th, we made the first um, sequence publicly available. I'm very privileged. I was part of the sequencing team. And so far, we have uh, sequenced about 356 samples. And this is kind of what really the distribution of variants look like. I know this is a complex slide. I'm going to try to take you through this. So in March, we just started our sequencing lab. We got one positive sample. We sequenced that sample. As we went on, every month we randomly picked samples. This is not biased or targeted sequencing. We were a testing lab. There were many samples coming to our lab. We would randomly select samples and sequence. Uh, and what we uh, are seeing over here, sorry, I, I think I have a little bit of legend missing here. It's cutting off, uh, but I'll take you through this. Uh, what we see over here is with time uh, from uh, April uh, to almost November, we really did not see any difference. Every color is a different variant, right? We did not see any difference in variants. These are common variants like 20A, 20B, 20C not concerning variants at all until November, December, we were not concerned. But suddenly in December, I'm sorry again, the legend uh, disappeared, but in December, we started uh, detecting the alpha variant, which is in green. This alpha variant was first um, detected in um, UK. And very quickly between January and February, we suddenly saw this switch from the alpha variant to the beta variant, the beta variant is shown over here in purple, first detected in South Africa. And in Bangladesh, there was actually this large second peak in March and April, and that was completely driven by the beta variant and shown over here in purple. And you can see how quickly the virus population completely changed and we were overwhelmed with this um, beta variant. Then came June. So in May, already some districts uh, in, in the Western a district of Bangladesh started detecting the Delta variant in red in Delta, and we're still gathering our data from June. But you can see again a very quick shift we saw in Bangladesh, where you know pretty much all our variants are gone, and all six genomes that we sequenced from June belonged to the Delta variant, and that's that's concerning. And I'll come, I'll come back to why it's concerning. But that is only our data, right? That's only one organization doing on the sequencing. So there is, of course, a small sample size. However, many, many labs, I think I'm, I'm really proud of that in Bangladesh, many labs have actually joined the sequencing efforts. And every day we are seeing people depositing, not only at the sequencing, they're openly sharing the sequencing data. And this is the data from entire Bangladesh, almost 1,800 genomes have already been sequenced in Bangladesh, and that's a tremendous effort. And we see similar trends. And over here, you can see the legend. So what, again, we see is between March and November, you know, nothing much interesting. Yes, we see the virus, very similar variants circulating. But suddenly, this change in January and February, where the beta variant takes over, and then starting in May, in entire Bangladesh, the Delta variant started taking over. So where are these data Delta variant mainly circulating? We know there are surges in the border districts, right? So let's let's look at the map of Bangladesh. And what we see over, <laughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> what we see is basically uh, the eight administrative divisions of Bangladesh. Most of the sequencing has been conducted in Dhaka, uh, about a thousand. And what we see, See, here 
a large proportion uh, till last month was the beta variant, but we are seeing uh, the proportion of the delta variant gradually increase. So this is the overall pie chart, right, from the very beginning. And then as we look at uh, the other districts, we see that the proportion of this delta variant is much, much higher in the Western uh, in the Western districts that borders India. Well, it's surrounded by India everywhere, but this is a very, very porous border. And that is where we first detected the delta variant, and that is that was probably also the place from where it spread. Okay, um, so over here again, all the gray are basically not variants of concern and in color are the variants of concern and we see uh, several variants of concern um, circulating, but again, Delta is uh, growing in proportion. I know I'm running out of time. I just uh, wanted to end with uh, this slide over here. It's basically the same phylogenetic tree that I've shown you before, but this is specifically for Bangladesh. So what we have done is in order for people, because there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of news that is being done and sometimes we don't know what is true, what is not true. So we, we have built a, a next screen build that is openly accessible to anybody. Anybody can go into this website, over here is the website, and real time they can see what are the variants that are circulating in Bangladesh. It's really user friendly. Uh, here is the website and we try to update that as frequently as possible. And what you can see here is there were, you know, um, the alpha variant circulating, then the proportion of beta um, started increasing from January, February, and now it's really dominated by delta. And here's the website. Uh, the general messages that I really want to end my talk with uh, is uh, tracking SARS-CoV-2 is definitely really important. It's important for uh, epidemiological studies, designing vaccines, and for understanding efficacy and effectiveness, right? Let's say we decide to bring in a vaccine. Is it really going to work? for uh, the viruses circulating in Bangladesh. So this real-time tracking is important. We shouldn't be concerned about mutations. We should be concerned about concerning mutations. However, as much as I am a, a geneticist and I, my livelihood depends on sequencing and you know, we talk about variants, basics do not change, right? We still have to uh, wear masks. Basics uh, do not change. We still have to wear our masks. Soaps still work. They do not discriminate uh, between variants. Masks do not discriminate uh, between variants. And with the inequity in vaccine distribution, we don't know when we will be able to vaccinate entire uh, Bangladesh. So really, we our non-pharmaceutical interventions are the best weapons we have so far. And none of that changes based on the variants that are circulating. So those were some general, uh, I think, take home messages that uh, we have from the work that we have been conducting. However, there are some personal messages and that, you know, we are talking about sequencing a lot. Um, here at the inaugural session talking about SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing, but let's not forget, let's keep this interest for every pathogen. Sequencing is important. It's important for every bacteria, for every virus. Let's not for, forget dengue. Let's not forget chikungunya. That wreck, dengue wrecks havoc every year. Let's not forget MDRTB. I really hope that the interest that we have right now in sequencing, the interest that we have in social media about talking about variants, we keep this interest and take this momentum forward to also think about other diseases and tracking other diseases. I hope we use this um, energy uh, and capacity that we are building. Uh, I think I'm going to end over there and thank you, the IAM again uh, for um, uh, uh, inviting me over here. It's an absolute privilege. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Shajuthi Shah, for your uh, beautiful and insightful presentation. Our next speaker, Dr. Ahmad Sharif. Dr. Ahmad Sharif completed his MBBS from Chittagong Medical College. He pursued Masters of Family Medicine from Medical University of Southern Africa in the year 1999. And currently, he's working as a family physician in Melbourne, Australia. And he's also an adjunct faculty of Bangladesh Institute of Family Medicine and Research. Today, Dr. Ahmad Sharif will enlighten us, giving some knowledge on how Australia beat COVID-19. Dr. Ahmad Sharif, please share your screen. Good evening from Australia and good afternoon to Bangladesh and the rest of the subcontinent. Tonight, I'm going to present lesson from the winners, how Australia beat COVID-19. 
while thinking about this um, topic, I was asking myself whether Australia is a real winner. Uh, I'm a bit uh, cautious about uh, saying Australia is a winner yet. Definitely Australia has taken an early lead. In Australia, we explain a lot of phenomenon in cricketing terms. Many of you will remember 20 years back in 2001 in an eventful five days in Kolkata in, at the Eden Gardens. In their first innings, Australia posed commanding 445 runs and destroyed India's first innings, uh, bowling them out of 171 runs. But India rose to the occasion after Australia have enforced a follow on and underestimated them and taught a good lesson that complacency has got no room in a long fight. And they have destroyed Australia's confidence. So talking about winning, I think the war is still on. Australia has taken an early lead, but the winning is not yet completed. We have, we have no room for complacency. But nevertheless, Australia has taken a lead and it is in a winning first innings position. Now, the uniqueness of Australia is, as you all know, Australia down under. It is its geographical location, as you can see, uh, it is in the middle of nowhere, totally isolated from the rest of the world. Unlike the Asian and European and African countries, one cannot drive to another country. One cannot just drive into Australia, one has to fly in. As soon as the international border is closed, the flights are closed, Australia is separated from the rest of the world. Then Australia's population density is very low. Uh, in a country which is uh, 50 times as big as Bangladesh, we only have 25 million people. And also the cities are physically or geographically separated. Uh, one major city to the other is five, six, 800 kilometers away, at least hundreds of kilometers away. And the most importantly, Australia has got money and resources. They are affluent. They can quickly mobilize money and resources to answer for a crisis. Now talking about the Australia's COVID situation, if we can just go to summarize the situation, uh, Australia has so far little over 30,000 cases, 910 deaths, and uh, this is a bit backdated. So the total test is more than 18 million. So you can understand Australia's strength in a population of 25 million people, we have conducted more than 18 million uh, tests. And I think this is the key to the success. If you compare it with the rest of the, I mean, the, with the USA and Bangladesh, uh, Australia has got a death rate of 36 per million people, whereby USA has got a death rate of more than 1,000 per million. And if you calculate in Bangladesh, it will be around 80 uh, death per million. So you can see why Australia is ahead of, of the game. Now, what process Australia has followed to come thus far? Uh, there is no magic pill, actually. It was back to basics. So there are a few pillars of Australia's success. One is the faith in science, early intervention, unambiguous stand from the government, and coordination and compliance. Now, what was the faith in science? That the policy were left for the health professional to formulate. There was no political interference. The politician didn't interfere with the health formulation. The implementation was left to the government. Uh, the government and the politician does, did the implementation part. And there was, it was backed up by good economic policy and good social support measure. There was no denial or conspiracy theory up in the air like the previous American administration did or some section in the rest of the world says we are stronger than Corona and the, so on and so forth. In Australia, there was very uh, clean cut stand from the government from early on, and there was no denial. Huge number of tests and massive contract tracing and early isolation and quarantine was the another key feature of Australia's success. Everywhere you go, there was QR or quick response code or manual signaturing, you have to enter yourself in any venue you go to any offices you enter, any shop you enter. So there is always you leave your trace behind so that 
if there is an outbreak, the contact can be traced. There was a contact tracing app at some stage in Australia, but because of the privacy issue, it was not very popular. Now, when we talk about early intervention, when the WHO was waiting for more data to come, quote unquote, the Australia imposed early border closure. All the international border was closed, the flight was closed, and they imposed early lockdown without any procrastination. They didn't wait for anything. And uh, they developed an early testing regime. In fact, Australia's Peter Duarte Institute was the first lab outside China to isolate the coronavirus from uh, and the novel coronavirus from patients. And they have erected large number of user-friendly uh, testing sites. It was everywhere. The unambiguous 10 government has taken there was a clear guidelines, no ambivalence, what you can do, what you can't do. And the communication was flickered through, through the media to everyone and the health professionals and the politician and the government spoke in the same voice. So there was no confusion uh, with the policy. And the coordination Australia does very well and did very well. From the very beginning, there was a bipartisan approach. The government and the official opposition in federal and state level coordinated through the Council of Australian Governments for the implementation, both the major parties came to an agreement and every decision taken with a consensus. And implementation decision-making, the unions were involved, the big business were involved, even the religious and ethnic community leaders were involved. So everybody had a sense of ownership to all the policy decision and implementation decision. So it was easy to implement. Now I'll talk about the compliance issue. From the very beginning, I call it as the instilling positive fear. What the media have predicted that if the right measure were not taken, Australia will have 15 million infection and from 150 to 300,000 deaths. It was not a fear mongering. It was not a spreading rumor. It was based on overseas data from the projection from the United States and Europe, the way the infection was happening there. So that is why the people got scared. It was a positive fear. It worked positively and the government uh, found it easy to implement its measure. And by doing so, the uh, research have suggested that 85% of the Australian population supported all government measures because people uh, were careful, they were scared of uh, dying. Now, and the other thing is that the compliance was helped by the brief and sharp lockdown, except in one incidence in Melbourne, uh, the all other places, the, uh, the lockdowns were very short, but sharp. And the compliance was not even only on the people itself. The government has to comply with their own regulation. Um, you might know that due to the quarantine breach, uh, one state health minister had to resign because she couldn't manage the quarantine properly. So there was compliance everywhere. Now, what were the actions taken through that process? Now, as I said that there was border closure, but what happened, the border closure was prompt and very sharp. And that was not only the international border, they have closed the interstate borders as well. From one state to another, they have separated so that the affected state situation didn't affect the unaffected states. Even they have created a hard border between the cities. Like, so there's uh, from Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane, the outbreak didn't go through the other regional cities. So it was contained in those big cities. So those hard border was implemented by military and police guard. Only the residents of Australia were allowed to return from overseas. And there was a particular cap not that everyone can flock in one day. So there was a limited number of people allowed every day. So what happened that helps managing the isolation and quarantine better so the system was not overwhelmed. And, and because of the slow intake of the returning travelers, what happened, it gave the government time to actually develop testing and contact tracing regime. Initially, there was a home quarantine system but then they found out there were a few breaches and then the government imposed mandatory hotel quarantine that was enforced by police guards. Now talk about the characteristics of the lockdown measures. The lockdowns, like I said, it was very prompt. 
even when there was a handful of cases like in their 10s and 20s, government imposed lockdown to hold the spread. So they didn't wait for the case to go in hundreds or thousands. So it was when it was less than 100, they uh, imposed the lockdown. So the cases were quickly contained. And they have imposed a zoning system, red, orange, and green zone. And the restriction varied uh, de depending on the outbreak or the strength of outbreak. And the lockdown, the, which was localized and uh, clustered, were enforced by curfew and fine. So that people had no choice but to complain, uh, comply. And lockdown, when they were imposed, that was very sharp, but withdrawal was gradual, so that one can keep a close eye on the evolving situation. And when there was a lockdown, it was not a total captivity. People were allowed to move around within five to 10 kilometer radius for essential shopping, exercise, or essential activities. So that even there was an outbreak that was limited to that 10, 15 kilometer radius, so that it was easy to contain. And that was that containment was supplemented by enough testing, contact tracing, and isolation. And there was a huge number of testing sites in every other suburb so that people found it easy to go for testing. All the non-essential business were closed, but uh, the schools and universities went online. And all the subsequent uh, outbreaks were actually contact from the quarantine or quarantine breaches. Now, very important thing Australian government found out that the frontline health workers are actually the potential super spreader. So from day one, they ensured that PPE for the doctors and all the health workers. And Australia, as you all know, has a GP driven primary healthcare system. So the beauty of that, that that facilitated a triage of trivial symptoms or severe symptoms that reduced the workload on the hospital. I was listening to one of the presentation uh, from Prabha Shamin when he was saying that uh, people didn't know when to go to the, some, some of them were too late, some of them were too early, but because Australia has a good triage system through the GP, uh, it was easy and there was no overloading at the hospitals. And the telemedicine government uh, from the very beginning approved a telemedicine and it was rebated through the universal healthcare system so that the, uh, that was a reduced burden on the face-to-face -face consultation. So the trial worked very well. Uh, one of them was accessible and universal healthcare, vigilant public health measure, and a so social support measure. So what are the social support measure? The government have announced uh, 130 billion Australian dollar relief package for COVID affected people. So when people were sitting at home, not going to work, they were actually paid a salary. So they didn't have to go out to look for work because they were, and even those who were renting, government made sure they are not evicted from their house because they couldn't pay the rent. And the food package was delivered to remote and indigenous community. And the most important thing, as the lockdown were localized, so where there was no lockdown, the economy was running and is running smoothly, unaffected. However, all this success brings us to a new challenge. The challenge is the, there is a chance that Australia can fall a victim of its own success. Because people are not dying right and left, because there are not a lot of uh, infection around, there is a vaccine apathy and vaccine hesitancy, especially after all those talk about uh, AstraZeneca vaccine side effects and so on. So the challenge is maintaining Australia's status quo and suppressing the Delta variant and managing the quarantine breach. And most important challenge is to open the international borders if we are not 100% secured. Now, that comes to the old saying, I consider uh, fighting against uh, COVID is like playing a test cricket. You haven't won the match until the last ball is bowled. You all remember 20 years back what VVS Luxman and uh, Harbhajan Singh did, rose to the occasion and taught a good lesson to Australia for their complacency. I hope that today after 20 years that the Delta variant doesn't rise to the occasion and uh, shouldn't allow our complacency if there is any to destroy our lead uh, because the fight goes on and we should be vigilant. The match is not yet over. And thank you very much for giving me the privilege of speaking in front of you. Thank you.
real uh, privilege for me to be present in such a scientific session and also having the privilege to speak on an issue which is completely different. I'm afraid that to you, since you have been actually dealing with this scientific sort of thing, this is completely a policy issue and a management issue. However, I think uh, those who have been actually working to deliver services, they should be knowing the reality of our financing system and how actually we could move forward to address these sort of emergencies and uh, pandemic situation. What I have learned like a layman and sort of beneficiary of the services, I want to explain in, in this way that two issues in healthcare are important. Whatever we do, whatever we try, whatever we research, or whatever we find out, that service should be available. And not only service should be available, it should be affordable. Otherwise, it, it, it would not mean anything to me. This is the main message of universal health coverage, which implies that everybody should enjoy, should receive the care he needs without undue financial hardship. And this actually implies two coverage. This is service coverage and financial. And this is the health system goal, actually. So in any health system, in any sort of treatment, in any sort of service, there should be, it should be accessible, affordable, with due quality and equitable. Whatever we do, whatever we know, what information we have, what scientific sort of discovery we made, we need a strong health system if we want to give out the services to the people they require. And health system is a synchronized sort of relationship I am sharing with you the very simplest form of health system framework, WHO devised this. This is comprising six building blocks centering around the people, the governance, information, finance, service delivery, human resources, medicine, and technologies. We people, those who are actually delivering the services, doing the research and other things, actually fall within the block of human resources and medicines, technologies are the scientific sort of thing. However, we'll be talking about the finance because finance is also very important. It is one of the building blocks. It influenced the other blocks because we know without finance, nothing actually moves and it affects the accessibility, the quality and equity of healthcare. And uh, we, we, we listened to the first presenter about the vaccine nationalism, the unequit unequitable distribution of vaccines and our hardship to get the vaccines. It's because of the finance and other technologies. And the finance lever, the finance building block can also be used as a means to reform the health service delivery organization. What is financing? Financing is actually three functions how we'll get money, how we'll raise the fund from tax, from insurance premium, from out-of-pocket expenditure, from fees, from donation. The second function is about pooling to making it together. And the third function is how actually we pay, we purchase services. We purchase services from, the, from hospital, we purchase the medicine, we, we purchase the manpower, other things. So in a system where these three functions are done very efficiently, adequately, and with proper measures, it actually become efficient financing. I would like to share with you the financing scenario of our health system. So it is, it is very important. And since we are listening to the Australian experience and other experience, how actually our health financing system is being structure is very important. So we spend very low level of public money in healthcare is less than 1% of the GDP and people spend 2% of uh, the rest of the GDP. In total, 3% of GDP is being spent for healthcare and the national budget is 5.4% of the current budget actually allocate the resources for health, health sector. And 
the striking feature of the health system in our country that most of the money is coming out of pocket. That means when the people are coming for services, they are spending from their ready cash. Then this is the this is called out of pocket expenditure, and it comprises sixty seven percent of the total expenditure. And per capita, in an estimate of uh, two thousand fifteen, we spend only thirty seven US dollar per capita per year. And big share of catastrophic payment, the families who actually spend. 15% of, of these families actually faces catastrophe and they sell out their asset or mortgage their property and other things. However, within the low level of spending, we have a lot of inefficiency and wastage. And all these things actually affects the accessibility, what actually the main goal that everybody should have access and utilization of healthcare is being obstructed by this inefficiency and wastage. So we, we discussed that the main source of money, main source of finance in health sector is coming out of the pocket. The household, the biggest pie in red color is providing. Government spending only 23%. And then we got support from rest of the world is 7%. And there are, I think, few voluntary insurance scheme providing very little amount of money to the health system. So what is the way out? So we do not have money, we, we have very less spending, we have to be very efficient, we have to innovate ways to generate resources, and we have to be very efficient in utilization. And with the principle that who needs more, we should give more to them. So what is the agenda for financing reform? What, for, for what actually we do it? The target is that we will reduce the out-of-pocket expenditure because when we require the spending, when we require the health service, we do not have money at the pocket. So we either, either we have to exclude it, we have to, I think, uh, not getting the service. Otherwise, we, I think there is no other way than selling properties and other things. So maximize the mandatory prepayment. That means the social health insurance is not for profit or commercial health insurance. It is that everybody would participate according to, to their ability. They will participate, rich, poor, healthy, sick. Everybody will participate in a socialistic sort of spirit that everybody will participate, but the utilization will be done who actually require it. This is the social health insurance spirit. And we should establish a large risk pool. Otherwise, if, if there are very fragmented, small scheme for health insurance, it will not actually cover very big risk. And government should use their its fund to cover those who do not have money to afford, I think, this sort of health expenditure. And the major thing that we need to change is the output from the input-based financing to output-based financing. That means we actually allocate money as per bed. We made a flat rate that everybody gets the same amount of salary, whether he works or not, whether he works over or not. So we should allocate money in terms of number of services delivered, in terms of services, in terms of sort of outputs. That, that is the main sort of thing that we need to reform in our allocation. So what government is trying to do, government has developed a finance, health financing strategy for 20 years. It has been trying to implement from 2012. And the main objective is to introduce the universal health coverage. And health financing strategy actually argues that government money, the public resources should be increased and there should be a mechanism to shift inefficient and inequitable private spending. Because we, we, we see that people are spending, spending out of their pocket. Some are spending much, some are spending less, some are spending, uh, I think, not very effective, not very efficient, going to our, our, uh, counter, buying medicine. So this every spending, if we could actually pull together the whole money and make a very good prepayment system, pooling system, that will be very efficient. 
and government should take the responsibility for protecting the poor and primary health care. That three things should be in the reform agenda of healthcare financing. And this strategy actually targets to achieve universal health coverage by 2030 and reduction of out-of-pocket expenditure, which is now 67%, almost half. And there should be universal protection of the total population through three means, the social health insurance, I already preempted on that, that everybody would participate, everybody would contribute according to his ability. However, the, the utilization will be done according to the necessity. And there should be the ongoing tax based health services, which is going on, which is functional now. And there would be community-based health insurance because most of the people in our country are in the informal sector. They live in the community. So there should be some community measures. So that is the original plan. Actually, we devised in 2012 that the poor people who could not afford, who could not give the premium, government should take their responsibility. At that time, it was 48 million. Probably it is number is less now. So they will be given a card and a package of care will be given free for the services. We have a very small formal sector who have regular income or regular job, teen number and other things. So they are government employees, civil servant, ready-made garments worker. So there should, for them, there will be a contributory health insurance scheme where the employer, employee, government will contribute. Even the buyer, they will contribute something. So there will be a package of care will be contributed through the contributory insurance system. We have a very big informal sector who do not have, I think, fixed profession, do not have ID, ID, a TIN number or something. So they will be, I think, captured through the government subsidy, micro health insurance and community-based health insurance. So these three measures will, will be taken and these three groups actually segregated and be addressed through the different means. And we have started, government actually started uh, implementing this uh, healthcare financing strategy for below poverty level population. The Shastra Shuraka Karmashuchi is being piloted. For admit garments worker, the schemes actually developed and is still is in the pilot phase. For government employees, government is trying to develop in insurance scheme. There are laws, I think, uh, drafted for national health protection the quality framework, benefit package, service standard, and monitoring framework is also being developed. So what is now, what actually we could do to implement all these things so that we could move progressively towards the universal health coverage? We need some sort of costing of services. We do not have a standard price or a standard cost. You, you, can, you can buy a, a surgery by a different price. So health is a public good and there should be some base pricing. And we should, be, we should have identification of services, which services will be delivered at what level. It's not that anybody can go anywhere. For that reason, we need a referral guideline. We also need the treatment protocol, otherwise the insurance or prepayment system will not work. If, if there are vari variation in treatment protocol, we should have capacity. Moreover, we should have cultural shift that everybody will pay with the hope that he will he may not use the service. However, everybody should pay. This sort of solidarity, this sort of cultural shift is very required, very urgent. Otherwise, this sort of social policy will not be implemented. You can ask, I'm a clinician, I'm a researcher, how you, you can do your financing, you can make your policy, is, is, is does not relevant to me, it's not. It's everybody's function. If the health system actually does not work properly, no sort of uh, innovation, no sort of scientific knowledge will work. So I think you have, in many ways, you have responsibility to, I think, propel the reform in financing in the health system. So I will request the scientific community, the, the healthcare uh, professional to take the reform agenda forward so that we could do whatever the reform agenda we, we discussed here, that we should have the output based financing, we should have more resources, we should have a pooling system. 
we can help in determining the benefit package because uh, we know that in ICD classification, there are a lot of medical conditions, which are the priority sort of medical conditions that we could uh, bring into the benefit package. Uh, the clinicians, the medical professional can help. We could actually set the standard of treatment and, and the protocols. Moreover, I think for a low resource setting country like us, we spend only 40, less than $40 per, per capita per year. Our United States actually spend $10,600 per capita per year. So only $40, how actually we can contain the cost? Otherwise we cannot give the services to the people. And you have a very good role in that. And we do not have any other option other than improving the efficiency. We have very low resource, very small amount of resource, and we have to have we have to have it better utilized, and setting the balance between prevention, pro promotion, and clinical care. Otherwise, we cannot give the clinical care everybody. That is the that is the uh, agenda for reform in in uh, finance health financing, and it will propagate I think the health system functioning better, and will help us to deliver the care to the people to, to achieve the universal health coverage. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, really, this is the kind need of a country because uh, we are a developing country, but there is no health coverage on Bangladesh. Uh, we are running short of time. So I am requesting uh, Professor Abdullah Shovinda, sir. Do you hear me, sir? I think the versatile topics today, sir. Professor Mojumda, sir. Professor Abdullah Shovinda, sir. Do you hear yes. me, sir? Yes, yes. Yes, I listen to you. Sir, you can hear me, sir? I can hear you. Do you hear me? Sir, the topics below, sir, I have a comment, but I have a question, sir. Do you hear me, sir? Do you hear me, sir? Do you hear me, sir? Clear, sir. Yeah. Very nice to listen to four lectures, which are for a very different topics on the very different topics. Um, may I go in the from, from the last speaker, Mr. Asadul Islam, who is very uh, close to me, and he spent a lot of time in making the health uh, economics in the, uh, in the the Ministry of the Health and Family Welfare. So he was the right person to present the these papers to us, though it is not directly related to the COVID, but I think COVID had exposed the need of the health reforms in our country. The one point he omitted, I think deliberately about the, the problem of mismanagement of the health services in our country, which is very a burning issue. And the, uh, the third one was the Mr. Ahmed, uh, Dr. Ahmed Sharif from the Melbourne. is a very interesting topic, which he delivered very nicely, but the experience of the Australia cannot be fit in the in Bangladesh due to the geographical nature, due to the financial matter, and all the other things. Anyway, but we have to learn from the countries where they are successful in containing the disease. And Dr. Shajuti Shaha, is, uh, she was delivering the, in the very basic thing, though it was not very easy to understand. Even then, we can understand the thing which we read in the papers so thank you very much, Dr. Sajuti Shah, Shah for making it, it simple. And last of uh, the first one was the Professor Redon Rahman, which very nicely uh, delivered the thing, the rise of the monsters in the philosophical way. Thank you very much for all the uh, programs and the thank you very much to the speakers for nicely uh, presenting their topics in this session. Thank you. Uh, Sajuti Shah, do you hear me? Uh, one I can question, hear you, one, yes. One question for you. Uh, which variant is yes. uh, most important for the children? Which variant of the COVID is dangerous for the children? Do you hear? Excellent question. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, absolutely excellent question. And I think we're getting more and more uh, data for children. What has happened is there's a little bit of a bias in the data because when we started dealing with COVID about um, you know, a year and a half ago, there was this idea that COVID does not affect children at all. So we were not focusing on children at all. We were not testing them. So we don't have a lot of data from the very beginning. There is quite a bit of data from Bangladesh, actually, where 
a lot of pediatric hospitals, including Dhaka Shisho Hospital, was constantly testing children coming in. And over there, we saw a high burden in children, even with the original variant. And uh, we are seeing similarly uh, with all variants, our children are affected as much as adults. Uh, we are not seeing any significant differences with variants uh, in the proportion of children and adult affected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, last comments from the Dr. Shomi Shah, Dr. Shomi Kumar Shah, for the last comments, because we are the running short of time, then you go for the second session. Dr. Shomi Kumar Shah. Shomi Kumar Shah, sir. Oh, thank you so much. This is really a great, great, great session. And, and I'm really very impressed with this. And specifically, it is the varieties. And then it's really gone from the philosophical Redouan, Professor Redouan, to the end. end <clears throat> at the end, when our ex-secretary really presented, and that's really wonderful. And then I believe that this will continue further. And I, I wish that we'll be having more and more sessions like this. And thank you so much. And all at the end, we are really going through a big crisis at this point, at least at the, around the border and all those places where really we are always thinking that there is no cases in the rural area. Now we can see in the union level and all these places. So now we all should really think about this, how we can really um, convince or maybe enthusiast, enthusiastically how we can really convince people so that they can follow the Shastra Vidhi, number one, and number two, how really people can convince the rural people so that they can really also control myself and they can remain in isolation. So all together, we just have to make sure that in the coming days, we can able to control this uh, monster in fact in the coming days. Thank you so much, thank you. And it was really nice. And thank you so much for organizing this beautiful session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, respected Professor Darun sir, excellent lecture. Then Dr. Ahmed Sharif from the Melbourne, I think is a uh, century by his talk and uh, Dr. Sajid Shah and our list. Uh, always Dr. Asadur Islam, he's the, he, he's the crying need of Bangladesh. I think he will talk more and more about the reform of health system next I, with IPDI. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody.